Okay, guys, welcome to class here at New Life Sanctuary Church. And I didn't see this many people sneak in behind me. I'm just so happy to see there's this much, this much interest in what we're talking about. This is going to be lecture number one in our Bible Basics course. We're going to loosely follow the little booklet that I created. Um, we're not going to just sit there and read the whole thing, but it's kind of a template, a roadmap to how we want the course to go. And I think it will be very helpful, and I think it should be enjoyable for everyone. A lot of what we cover in the course, you're, you're going to know this stuff already. If you've been walking with the Lord for any length of time, you're going to know this material. But maybe uh, it, it comes to you in the course in a different way, a way that's particularly helpful. Maybe it's a better way to share this material with others. Um, maybe I introduce some new verses. Maybe there are uh, passages in the Bible that speak to these doctrines that you didn't see before. You know, this, I think this is going to be helpful and uh, add something to your knowledge base, something that you can use um, to your own edification and, and for the good of others in your own personal evangelism and so on. So what I want to do is uh, launch the course with a word of prayer, and then we'll get right to it, and we'll let the Lord steer this thing. Let's pray. Dear blessed holy God, we come before you with grateful hearts. Thank you, Lord, that uh, we're able to gather here to uh, pull aside from the world and give you special attention here today, your, your special, inscripturated revelation the Bible. Uh, Lord, help us to understand these doctrines in a deeper way. Help us to be more capable, articulate, courageous, and faithful ambassadors for Jesus, using this material properly for Christ's glory and for the good of others. And so, Lord, we just want to commit what we're doing to your tender care and ministry tonight. We pray it's enjoyable to everyone and helpful to them. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. Okay, so um, if you open up to page one in the booklet here, I have a little introduction. And the first thing we're going to do uh, by way of introduction is jump out of the booklet and into the Bible. because there's. A... And let me just say this. <laughs> there are eight topics we're going to cover in the course. We want to hit each, we want to hit each topic. Uh, each class gets a topic. That's what I'm trying to say. So eight topics, eight classes, and then we're done. But honestly, each one of these topics could easily take up a 60-hour college course. So I'm really taking a risk here, right? Because... We want to encourage discussion here in the class, but <laughs> we also want some momentum here. These are Bible basics. So we're just going to commit it to the Lord's care and ministry, and, and uh, we'll see what he does with this. But I want us to go to the Bible here, to Mark chapter 12. This will give us our introduction. This will get, get us a running start and get our heads in the right place. Mark chapter 12. Okay, so in uh, Mark 12, we're going to put in at verse 28. Mark 12, 28. Then one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, that he's asking Jesus here in context, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second, like it, is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So the scribe said to him, Well said, teacher, you have spoken the truth, for there is... Uh, for there is one God, and there is no other but He. And to love Him with all the heart, and with all the understanding, with all the soul, and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself is more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Now when Jesus saw that He had answered wisely, He said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. But after that, no one dared question Him. This is a very, very important passage of Scripture. The Lord was asked, of all the commandments, which are the most important? 
Jesus says, Deuteronomy 6, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, with all your mind and heart. That's, this is, that's an amazing um, formula there. An amazing formula. God wants you to love him with all your heart, yes, but your mind too. And in fact, uh, the scribe sort of uh, reiterates what Jesus said in verse 33. Uh, he says, and to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding, with all the soul and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself is more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Loving him with all the understanding. You know what this means, friends? It means that theology is important. Uh, God just doesn't want some kind of syrupy sentimentality. Uh, you're to sing praises with understanding, says the psalmist. Uh, we have to know some things. We don't have to all have earned degrees. That's fine. But there are some things God expects us to know. It's really important. Uh, from its inception, Christianity has been a teaching, preaching religion. Uh, we are a religion with a message. It's the gospel. It's called good news, right? Isn't that what gospel means? Good news. So we have a message, a message with content. And again, you don't need to be some kind of scholar. You don't need to have letters after your name. But you need to know some things. You remember Hosea 4.6? Uh, God laments. He says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. knowledge. And Paul says of his countrymen, the Jews, in um, Romans 10, verse 2, he says, I bear them witness that, that my countrymen, the Jews, have a zeal for, no for God, but not after knowledge, not according to knowledge. And that's enough to keep them out of the kingdom. A zeal with no knowledge. There are some things God expects us to know. And then on the other hand... Uh, you don't want to keep going down that road and display no genuine heart involvement here. So you remember that the Lord Jesus confronted seven churches in Asia Minor, remember? And the first one on the list is Ephesus. And he says, you people are hardworking and you're doctrinally sound and you are, boy, you're discerning. You can weed out the false apostles and the false prophets you're, and you're busy. You're really laboring. And, and you know what the Lord said? He says, I have something against you, and I'm about to remove your candlestick. And you say, what's the problem here? And, they, and Jesus said, you have left your first love. So all the head knowledge in the world, all the degrees in the world, you can have the Bible memorized backward and forward. If you don't really love Jesus, it won't do you any good. I mean, isn't that the, this is at the end of, I think it's the first epistle to the Corinthians. If it isn't the first one, it's the second one. But Paul says... Uh, let him who does not love the Lord Jesus be anathema. So you can know all kinds of theology, but if you don't love Jesus, it won't do you any good. And so it's very important that, um, that we want to hit both things. We want, to, we want to run in both directions as fast as we can, knowing as much as we can about God and loving God. And I don't like, that. I don't like the idea of balance here. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, you're loving God a little too much compared to how much you know. So maybe you should cut back on the loving a little bit just to get this in balance. Well, that's, that's ridiculous nonsense, right? You can't love God too much. <laughs> and you can't know too much about God. So you want to run in both directions at the same time here. And I think that's what God would want from us. So uh, our religion is a teaching, preaching religion. It has a message. It has content. And... Um, we want to say, and I think this is pretty true, we want to say that the main things are the plain things in the Bible. The Bible is infinitely deep, of course. Uh, you will spend the rest of your life puzzling over the gospel, and never mind the other stuff that's in there, all the neat shadows and types and hidden prophecies and all kinds of thematic unity that you see in the Bible. That will keep you busy for a trillion lifetimes. But just the gospel itself, the mystery of God becoming a man, uh, suffering and dying on the cross to pay uh, our sin debt in full? How does that all work? What's happening here? There's mystery to this. We believe it to the saving of our souls, but it's infinitely deep. We're sort of wading in the shallows here, aren't we? And that's, that's how it's going to be into eternity. The more we learn, the more there is to learn. And so, uh, But what we want to say is, for our purposes, in terms of uh, coming into a saving knowledge of Jesus... Uh, receiving new birth, 
being capable ambassadors for Christ. Really, the main things are the plain things in the Bible. And Paul actually said it, didn't he, in uh, 2 Timothy, the third chapter. He said, uh, Timothy, from a child, you've known the Holy Scriptures that are able to make you wise into salvation. From a child, you didn't need to go to Bible school. You didn't need to get a degree. You know, you didn't have to, whatever, hire a guru or something. From a child, you knew what was, what was necessary. Of course, he was taught, right, by his mother and grandmother. The capable teachers were helping Timothy. But uh, So my little booklet here is meant to introduce people to the plain things, the main things. Okay, that's the whole point. And these are the things I think are the most important as a minister of the gospel. There's lots of things we could talk about, but these eight I thought were really important. So that's the reason why these eight and nothing more in our little booklet here. So if you turn the page, and we're going to look at the first doctrine here tonight. And my plan, folks, is to go for one hour, and the clock is ticking, we're ten minutes in already. My plan is to go for an hour, or a little less, maybe, seven to eight. If we want to hang around for half an hour or 45 minutes, whatever, that's fine. But really, we don't want to be here all night, right? So I'm not kicking anyone out, by the way, I'm just saying in case you're wondering, is this guy going to talk for five hours here? <laughs> I'm not going to. I think, I think we can do this concisely. Okay, so the doctrine of God. So um, I kind of write here that nowhere in the Bible does uh, God offer you an argument for his existence. Uh, you don't see Peter arguing for the existence of God. You don't see Paul argu arguing here um, evidentially. They don't build this sort of uh, inductive case for the existence of God. The Bible just flat out says um, God's existence is evident to everybody, and it's foolish to deny it. I mean, that, isn't that uh, Psalm 14 and verse 1? The fool has said in his heart there is no God. And Paul speaks like that too in uh, 1 Corinthians in the first chapter and verse 20. Uh, Paul says, he kind of lays down the gauntlet. This is first, maybe I should write some of this down in case you want to take notes, but it's, uh, it's uh, Psalm 14, 1, the, the, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And that's, that's not name calling. That's not just, you don't believe in God, so na 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 na, you're a fool. <laughs> yeah, this is actually a descriptor, it's describing the thinking of this person. So Paul, in 1 Corinthians 1, 20, he sort of lays down the gauntlet here. And Paul says, where is the wise, where is the, scri where is the scribe, where is the debater or the disputer of this age? Has God not made foolish the wisdom of this world? And Paul will expand upon that in the, in the book of Ephesians, uh, chapter 4, beginning in verse 17, where he actually comes right out, and he's not using hyperbole. He's saying the thinking of these people is absolutely foolish. It's nonsense. It's vain. It's... it's it's not going to get you anywhere. And we'll talk about this at the end of the course when we do a little bit of apologetics at the end of the course, but if I could just sort of telegraph what, what we're going to do, we want to show that you need to presuppose God in your thinking. You need to have God as the rock-solid foundation. You need to presuppose Him. You need to assume that God has spoken in the Bible if you are to have a coherent worldview. If you're, if you're going to have a worldview, your beliefs about life and the world, your, your beliefs about reality and knowledge and ethics, if you're going to have a consistent view of these things that coheres together, it's what everybody's shooting for, you can't do that unless you presuppose the God of the Bible. And we'll talk about that more at the end of the course. But for right now, this is the thinking of Paul, and this is the thinking of others in the Bible, that uh, it's foolish to deny the existence of God. Just because, the, first of all, God has revealed himself to every heart. Romans 1, 18 to 20, says that God has revealed himself immediately to everyone's heart. Uh, God, it isn't the case that people go out, they look at sun, moon, and stars, or they look at the complexities of some biological system, and then they, through just unaided, autonomous human reason, deduce that God must exist. That's not what's happening here. What's happening is that God has revealed himself spiritually, immediately, supernaturally to every heart. And that explains why people say and do the things they're saying and doing. 
like when they make a moral evaluation, a moral judgment, they sort of have this knowledge that there is some objective morality in the world and God has written it on their hearts, they're aware of it, they don't want to openly acknowledge God, but they know that God exists, they, and they give evidence of that when they make a moral judgment, right? And uh, when they appeal to any objective standards, they're really giving evidence that they know God. So the Bible doesn't really make a big argument for the existence of God, just says it's foolish to deny him. And uh, what we want to do here, we want to think about this God tonight. We want to see what the Bible has to say about him because he discloses himself, doesn't he, in the pages of Scripture. And then ultimately he discloses himself in the person of his son Jesus. But I want us to go, please, to Isaiah chapter 42. Just go back to Isaiah, the, the 42nd chapter. And I want us to see some amazing things here in that chapter. Isaiah 42. <clears throat> And uh, the reason why we want to look at Isaiah 42 is because in the book of Acts, chapter 17, the Apostle Paul gave a magnificent defense for the Christian faith, uh, a magnificent apologetic, a magnificent uh, evangelistic strategy he displayed there in Athens, in Acts 17. And he is going to share his Christian worldview with these Greek philosophers and Paul is not the least bit concerned that everything out of his mouth was absolutely countercultural to those. Everything he said would have been offensive to them. Uh, you could tell he's not trying to be offensive. He begins the speech by saying, Gentlemen, I notice that in all things you're very religious. Uh, I'm interested in spiritual things also, so let's talk. He's, he's, you know, he's not trying to be argumentative or offensive, but the fact is, he's not going to compromise not one tiny bit on his Christian convictions. And so everything out of his mouth is absolutely countercultural and in head-on collision with the religious philosophies of these people. And uh, what he introduces them to is a portrait of God. And he doesn't quote Isaiah 42 because those men would never understand that. He can't say to these Greeks, I'm now giving you uh, the words of the great prophet Isaiah. He doesn't talk like that because they don't know Isaiah. But if you compare Isaiah 42 to Acts 17, you will see that Paul's almost quoting verbatim from the prophet. So he is not going to water down or make, uh, more, um, make uh, his Christian worldview more agreeable to people. He's just going to tell them the truth. And whatever happens, happens. So look at Isaiah 42, beginning verse 5. And this is what Isaiah writes here. Isaiah 42, 5. Thus says God the Lord who created the heavens and, the, and stretched them out, who spread forth the earth and that which comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness and will hold your hand and keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles to open blind eyes and to bring out prisoners from the prison, those who sit in darkness from the prison house, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory I will not give to another, nor my praise to carved images. Behold, the former things have come to pass, and new things I declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. So think about what we just read there in that passage, and can we come up with some uh, attributes maybe of God, or some, some descriptor words of God? What, what are some of the things we learn about God here? Just reading this passage. Can we brainstorm? What do you see here? Hey? He is the creator. The creator of what? He created the heavens. Whoops. The heavens and the earth. Okay, space and matter. God created spatial dimensions. Yes, that's Romans chapter 8 where Paul lists out all the things that cannot separate us from the love of God. And one of the things he, he mentions there is spatial dimension. Neither height nor depth nor any other created thing. Oh, so even space and spatial dimensions are creatures, right? So this God, the creator of heavens and earth, therefore must be eternal 
Well, that's pretty bad writing, but it must be eternal, timeless, spaceless, enormously powerful. But what else are we seeing in our passage here? Uh, righteous, sure. Uh, can we say righteous or morally perfect? Yeah. Morally perfect? From the New Testament, we understand that God is love. He is omnibenevolent, right? And love surely is the greatest of ethics. But, yeah, we can see a moral dimension here for sure. I've called you in righteousness, he says. What else do we see here? He's a person. Has a name. Okay. God is personal. This is so important, friends, because in the history of the church, uh, unfortunately... Well, fortunately and unfortunately, really, uh, Greek modes of thinking, uh, the Greek language, Greek terms, Greek philosophy, came into the church very early on. And in some ways it's good, because uh, Greek is very precise. There's no mistaking what's being said here in Greek. So you could use the Greek language, which is a very large language compared to Hebrew, which is very small, you can use the Greek language to articulate, describe uh, very precise religious and theological concepts, like the Trinity, for example. The Greek language is very helpful to that. Unfortunately, one of the big guns in Greek philosophy is a guy named Aristotle. You ever hear of him? And Aristotle has a, a, a conception. Uh, he thinks there is a being called God. And he uses his, his brilliant, unaided human reason to deduce that this God must be like non-personal, non-involved, non-connected to the world, wholly other. And that kind of thinking has uh, crept into the religious world in many places. Islam is like that too. Islam says Allah is uh, completely unknowable. Allah is unlike anything in the created order. You can't even predicate about Allah. Wholly transcendent, the only thing you can say about Allah are the things that he's not. That kind of thinking uh, has been part of the Christian church too over the years. And by the time you're done, you've got a God that is so transcendent, you really can't say anything definite about this God. He's incomparable. There's, the, there's nothing similar to God in the entire created order. And therefore, since we're personal agents, God can't be personal because that would make him like us. You see the problem there? You've got this sort of mysterious something that created the world, but it's, a, it's an impersonal force of some kind. But friends, that is not the God of the Bible. Yes, God is mysterious. Yes, yes, God is eternal. God is transcendent. But God, as a matter of fact, discloses himself as personal. There is a mind there. There is a will there. I believe there is emotions there. Right? We can get into the whole... Is God impassive or not? But that, I believe he gets angry. I think God has a constant, hot, anger, hostility towards sin. Uh, but, but Jesus says there's rejoicing in heaven when one sinner repents. And uh, the Bible talks about Jesus being anointed with the oil of gladness and all that. I mean, I, I read Zephaniah 3. It sounds to me like God rejoices too. So it looks to me that we are dealing here with a God who is personal. And he talks to people. And he makes promises to people. And it, it, the Bible says it re, the Lord regretted that he made man on the earth in Genesis 6. See, God has feelings, thoughts, emotions, feelings, plans, purposes. And he talks to people, right? And that's important because it takes a personal agent to make promises, to make guarantees, right? So am I going too fast here? No. Yeah, okay. So, I mean, and this ties into this foolishness that we're talking about here, the foolishness of unbelief. You make plans for tomorrow, I do too. Why? Because deep down we know that there's a personal God who runs the world, and he's made us some promises about law-like regularity out there, so you can make plans for tomorrow and learn some things about the world. But if you didn't have those guarantees, what would you have? You'd have thoroughgoing skepticism. You, you wouldn't really be sure of anything. And, and that, is, that is a thing, you, you can track that down, you can chase that rabbit all the way, right? That, that's a ra whole rabbit trail. But that, that is um, what we're going to talk about at the end of this course. 
Uh, what else are we seeing here about God? That he's jealous. A jealous God. Um, Sorry, I, I skipped ahead. The, oh, you did, eh? <laughs> Sandra, okay. <laughs> um, how about this one? I was going to say he's physical. Physical? He holds your hand. He takes care of you. Got to be careful here, because if God created the heavens and the earth, uh, matter is that which is extended in space, and God created space, so he's got to be non-material. And in fact, you remember in uh, John, I think it's 424, uh, Jesus said, God is spirit. <coughs> and in Luke 24, he said, a spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me have. So God is, God is, God doesn't occupy space, he's not extended in space, right? Well, this is uh, symbolic, I think. God doesn't have hands. He doesn't have a body, right? I, I think this is just him saying, I'm going to take care of you. I mean, in context here, he's really talking about Jesus, isn't he? I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness and will hold your hand and keep you and give you as a covenant to the people. Okay? The new covenant, by the way, is not just a contract. It's a person. The, the new covenant is Jesus. And he establishes that covenant himself in his own blood. He's the mediator of that new covenant. He's the executor of his own will. <laughs> you remember? Uh, he, is the, he is the one who established the New Testament. And Hebrews 9 says, no testament is in force unless there's the death of the testator. And that's Jesus. So this here, Isaiah 42, is referring there in part to Jesus, for sure. So he's a, he's a faithful promise keeper. When he tells us something, he, when, he, when he says here, um, he's a covenant God. Yeah, he established covenant. Oh, are we still back in personal? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Asking. Impersonal forces can't establish covenants with people. Right. And if he's going to establish covenants with us, he must be personal. Okay, so that is another, just an offshoot of personal. Yeah, I, I think he, he's a covenant-making and covenant-keeping God for sure. Um, how about this one? Doesn't he say at the end of our passage, verse 9, Behold, the former things have come to pass, and new things I declare before they spring forth, I tell you of them. Now, what are we learning there? Omniscient. He's omniscient. God... And of course, this is flushed out in other places in the Bible, but this is at least um, drawing us in that direction, that God is omniscient. Uh, I think Psalm 139 would be a good place to look also. Uh, God, we want to say, is uh, all-knowing. He is omniscient. God has never learned anything. God knows all things. That, he knows all truths in a, in a seamless intuition, an eternal glance. God knows everything. God is omniscient. And I think what we want to just say here, if we could just so like, uh, distill it all down, uh, a proper definition of God really would be that God is the greatest conceivable being. Now, if someone asks you, what do you mean by God? Well, you say, well, God is the greatest conceivable being. And in the area of philosophy, there's at least some kind of general agreement on what constitutes great making properties. You know, an agent that can think and make decisions is greater than an object that can't. And you just go down the line. A uh, being with authority is greater than a being without authority. And God is the supreme authority. And in fact, you remember in the book of Hebrews chapter 6, I think it's 618, uh, the writer there says, uh, when God wanted to make a promise to Abraham and confirm it with an oath, God swear by himself, why? He could swear by none greater. And that's the Bible telling you that God just is the greatest conceivable being. If you could conceive of a being greater than God, that being would be God. But you can't, and I can't either. No one can. He's the greatest conceivable being. And I think that's, um, that's kind of how we might uh, describe God. If someone's looking for a rough and ready definition, there you go. The great. But this means, you know, this morally perfect God, you know what that means? That means he can't lie to people. God can't lie. Titus 1-2, I think it's Titus 1-2, 
God can't, he cannot lie. Not that God just is in the habit of telling the truth. He can't lie. Uh, when, you know, when you contradict yourself, you engage in the character of lying. And uh, God can't lie, and he doesn't want us to lie, and therefore God doesn't want us to contradict ourselves either. That's why the Bible's perfect. There's no contradictions in the Bible. Uh, God is not the author of confusion. He doesn't contradict himself. He doesn't say one thing and, they, and then say something else. Now, that doesn't mean there aren't Bible difficulties. There are Bible difficulties, but there's no genuine contradictions. I've, I've run into Bible difficulties, and you sort of put them on the back shelf in your head, and sometimes years later, you, you, you discover the answer to the problem. You didn't throw your Bible in the garbage can because you came across a Bible difficulty. You just set, it, set that difficulty aside, ask God for some help, and he'll show you that it's not a contradiction. Uh, God can't contra contradict himself, okay? Any thoughts or questions about any of that? Well, you kind of skipped over the jealous part then. Is that part of personal? Uh, where is that? In that verse 8, my glory will not give to me. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, the Lord, uh, where are we? Verse, oh, verse 8. I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory I will not give to another, nor my praise to carved images. Um, good point. We want to say that there is only one God, oh, Johnny boy, one God who is God by nature. So, um, if you go to, say, Galatians 4, I can't remember the verse, but Paul says, you know, people in time past, they were doing service to things that aren't gods by nature. They call them gods, but there's, there's only one God who by nature is God, and that's Jehovah in the Bible. And, and God says um, his glory goes nowhere else. It's for him alone, because he's unique, right? God is unique in that way. Now, that's, this is a fantastic segue, by the way, to something else we want to talk about, and that is the tri-personal nature and character of God. The, God is multi-personal. Okay, so how do you know? Because this passage here says that uh, God will not give his glory to another. But how many of you remember... John 17, 5, and you, there you have Christ's high priestly prayer to the Father. And you remember what he said in John 17, 5? Who can find it? Yes, can you read it loud and clear? Oh, this is like sword drill at camp. And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Aha, okay. So now we're hearing that this one we know as Jesus of Nazareth pre-existed the creation of the world. And not only that, he was in some kind of relationship with God the Father, and they shared glory together. Now that's very mysterious, isn't it? I mean, God just said, I don't give my glory to someone else. But Jesus said, I had glory with you before the world was. And of course, in, in the light of New Testament revelation, we understand that Jesus Christ is God become a man. And we understand that God is tri-personal. There's one God, there's just one God who is God by nature, but that nature is shared by three persons. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And that's, I mean, that's mysterious. And it took a couple centuries for the church to select just those perfect Greek philosophical terms to articulate this doctrine without running into contradiction. So when, we, when someone asks us about Trinity, we don't say we believe in one God and three gods. That, that's contradiction. And we don't say we believe that God is one person and three persons. That's contradiction. We say, rather, we believe in one God, one eternally existing being, God, from everlasting to everlasting. One God with a single nature. But that nature is shared by three persons. Or three centers of consciousness, maybe, we can put it that way. Or three complete sets of rational faculties might be another way to put it. Three persons share the same nature. One represents the whole. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Remember that? Uh, Colossians 2.9 says that all the fullness of the Godhead dwells bodily in Jesus. And uh, in Acts chapter 5, 
lying to the Holy Spirit is the same as lying to God. So each member of the Trinity represents the whole Godhead. One God, three persons. And you know what that means, friends? That means that love relationship is not an afterthought. It doesn't mean that God was a single person who was lonely before the creation of the world. <laughs> it means that love has an eternal characteristic or quality to it, right? Father, Son, Holy Spirit in love relationship, timelessly, we'll say logically and causally, prior to the creation of the world, love existed. There's an ultimacy to love. And that's why we find love so valuable and significant, don't we? I remember I had a debate with an atheist, public debate with this atheist. And, I, and he's a materialistic atheist. He said, oh, everything comes down to space, time, matter, and energy. That's it. We're just meat machines. <laughs> We're just bags of biochemical stuff, right? That's his philosophy. And yet uh, he sees value and significance to love. Love would just really be accidental misfirings in your brain. It would just be atoms banging into each other producing this emotion called love, but what would be valuable or significant about it? So I asked him right there in the debate, can you give a causal explanation for the value and significance that you attach to love? I can do it, because it reflects the nature and character of God. But I want you to tell me, in terms of your worldview, why love should be cherished, you know, valued. And he said, uh, I, ca I can't. And he says, I admit it, my worldview is irrational. <laughs> and I said to him, speak into the microphone, let them hear it. And, uh, and there were some salvations that happened there at that debate. Well, a couple days after, right? People got saved because atheism had nothing. But uh, so God exists et uh, eternally, uh, timelessly, at least prior to the creation. And uh, God has existed from all eternity as a trinity. And if you just flip ahead a couple pages in your Bible to Isaiah 48... We're going to get a, we're just going to get introduced to one of many, many verse passages in the Old Testament that hint at the, at the multi-personal uh, character of God. Uh, in the Old Testament, you, you encounter all kinds of mysterious singular plurals in the Old Testament. I mean, it starts right in the beginning. Who remembers the first verse of the Bible? Anyone? In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, right? Everyone knows those ten words. In the beginning, God, Elohim. That's a plural noun. Plural. In the beginning, Elohim, plural, created, bara, singular verb. Right away, we see a grammar problem. And we're introduced to the mysterious singular plural associated with God. It's going to run all the way through the Bible. God says, let us make man in our image and likeness. Who, who, who's he talking to? Angels? No. Some rabbi said, well, maybe he's talking to the dust of the earth. Really? <laughs> and, you know, God says, uh, after, this, after man sinned, he said, the man's become as one of us to know good and evil. And you remember Isaiah, the prophet, his call, his commission? And God asks the question, uh, who will I send and who will go for us? Mysterious, singular plurals, all the way through the Bible. Zechariah the prophet, Zechariah 12, uh, God prophesies. He says, they will look upon me whom they've pierced and mourn for him as for a firstborn. They pierce me? God says, you're going to pierce me? I mean, you, we understand now, don't we? That God was prophesying the, the crucifixion, where God become a man would, would experience death, right? But... Uh, the Jews of old, uh, they maybe didn't know how to understand this, but they didn't monkey with the text. They didn't amend it or alter it. They just left it, left the mystery there. And in light of the New Testament, we understand. But I do want to share um, Isaiah 48 with you, uh, beginning in verse 12. 12 to the end of 16 is one block. It's one continuous block of text. And as we're reading 12 to 16... We, we must continually ask ourselves, who's talking here? All right, verse 12, Isaiah 48, 12. Listen to me, O Jacob, and Israel am I called. I am he, I am the first, I am also the last. Indeed, my hand has laid the foundation of the earth, 
and my right hand has stretched out the heavens. When I call them, they stand up together. Who's talking? God's talking. I mean, who else could it be, right? <laughs> uh, it's not Isaiah. Verse 14. All of you assemble yourselves and, and hear. Who among them has declared these things? The Lord loves him. He shall do his pleasure on Babylon, and his arms shall be against the Chaldeans. I, even I, have spoken. Yes, I have called him. I have brought him, and his way will prosper. Come near to me. Hear this. I have not spoken in secret from the beginning. From the time that it was, I was there. And now the Lord God and his Spirit have sent me. Now this is God speaking all the way through. And right at the very end of the passage, he says, The Lord God and his Spirit have sent me, and the me is the Creator. He says right at the beginning of the passage, My hand laid the foundation of the earth. And again, in the light of New Testament Revelation, we understand that Christ is the creator, and the Father sent him, and Jesus was a spirit-led man, wasn't he? The spirit led him out in the wilderness, for example, to be tested by the devil and so on. So we have, again, we see this um, an amazing reference to the triune character of God. And, of course, when you come to the New Testament, the light switch goes on, and you kind of see what's been sort of hidden in a bit of shadowy darkness there, all the way through the 39 books of the Old Testament. Uh, any thoughts or questions about any of that? Thoughts, questions? Yeah, Dan. Well, I just, I just like, the, like how even the smallest, uh, well, not smallest, but like even the most like, simple topic, like God being personal. Throughout the Bible, there's absolutely no question that you know, it's, there's no contradiction about him being a personal God. Where, say, like Islam, where you know, uh, even even like it saying talks about it being unknow him being unknowable. Then, meanwhile, he talks about being closer than uh, closer uh, closer than uh, than than your jugular, I believe it is. It's like, yeah, well, something like that. Yeah. How on earth can you know that? Like, I mean, if, if yeah, he's unknowable. How can you even know anything like that? It, it just seems like there's like instant contradiction. Yeah. In any other competing faith system. There is, and really. Christianity avoids uh, the problem that other theisms run into. Um, on the one hand, you need a God who is transcendent, a God who is over and above everything. You've got to have a God like that who's in control. He's not contingent. He depends on nothing. Uh, you, you need a God like that to ground the existence of everything else in the world, right? You've got to have it. Um, but that's insufficient, though. Uh, if this God doesn't talk to you and tell you what he's like and what his plans and intentions are for you and the rest of the world, then you're left in darkness. So it's insufficient just to have a transcendent, all-powerful God. You need some special revelation, right? You need some authoritative, special revelation. Now, on the other hand, uh, you have religions that have gods that are imminent, but they're not ultimate now. So they, they're just big versions of us like the Greco-Roman deities or the gods of the Mormons. They're just big versions of ourselves. And they're not ultimate. They sort of come into being, too. They sort of evolve into existence. And what's really ultimate for these people um, would be space, time, matter, and energy, really. Uh, Brigham Young and Joseph Smith, uh, they taught that matter was eternal. And so now we have impersonal forces that are really ultimate, and those forces can't make any promises to us. They can't make guarantees to us. How are we supposed to navigate through this life? How are you supposed to make plans for tomorrow? Or, or make any principled moral complaint about anything? I mean, there's, there's nothing there. Everything is subjective. And chance becomes ultimate, right? Well, the God of the Bible is both. Right? He is, he is the guy in charge. There's no one higher than God. God is not contingent. He is ultimate. And as a matter of fact, he does talk to us. He says, I'm in charge of this created order, and I'm going to tell you some things about it. I'm going to tell you some things about yourself. I created you with the requisite rational and cognitive faculties so that you can learn some stuff. I want you to learn truth. And I'm making some guarantees about law-like regularity in the created order so that you're living in a cosmos and not a chaos. And see, see God gives us everything that's necessary for us to navigate meaningfully through this life and to make sense out of our experiences. 
And if you didn't have this God, I'm telling you, you'd be in hopeless darkness. And the fact is that advocates of the competing, uh, competing faith systems out there, they can learn about the world, they can make meaningful scientific discoveries and all that stuff, not because their worldview is true, but because ours is. In terms of their worldview, they can't explain what they're doing. They can't tell you how they know stuff. <laughs> they can't tell you anything. They have to borrow capital from our worldview, philosophical capital, you see? And that's something we will discuss later on. Sandra, did you have a question there? I, well, I was just going to ask or just bring into, into this discussion, it, it makes perfect sense then when we look at these other... Um, cults or belief systems that they have to keep doing sacrificial things, right? They've got to keep because these gods or these many gods they have can't promise them anything. So they keep trying to trying to get higher up and higher up. And yeah, so like one of the oldest religions in the world would be Hinduism mm -hmm. and the Vedic religion that acted as the kind of root for Hinduism. V Vedism came first. And the old Vedic religion uh, taught originally a monotheism. Mankind's original religion was monotheistic, and we're not surprised, because we all have a, a common heritage back to Noah's family, and then further back to Adam and Eve, right? So we're not surprised that the oldest religions were monotheistic, right? But even in the Vedas, you can see this uh, de-evolution happening where Originally, they believe in a sky god who's the creator and who holds people morally accountable. Uh, very soon, they begin to deify his attributes. Like wisdom becomes a god now, or power becomes a god. And you can track this, this uh, degeneration in religious thought. You, you can actually see that. And what happens is uh, these ancient Hindus begin to believe that all these gods are holding the cosmos together. They're sort of... Uh, using their energy to do this, and you need to offer sacrifices to replenish the God's energy. This is where this sac you see, sacrifice is all, it's always there. It's part of the, all the ancient religions. And again, we're not surprised, are we? Adam sinned, and God killed a couple animals to clothe that man and his wife, right? To cover them. He's teaching, those he was teaching the first man and his wife a little something called uh, substitution. Adam's alive, innocent animal's dead, and Adam's wearing his skin. Right? Substitution. And that you look all the way down the corridor of time till you get to Jesus Christ. And it says in uh, Galatians chapter 3 that as many as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So sacrifice is right there at the dawn of human history after the fall. Right? So you see sacrifice showing up. But warped and twisted concepts, right? Like we have to offer sacrifice to keep the gods healthy so our crops will be good or whatever. And this collapses into this business-like relationship with the gods where there's no moral dimension to this anymore at all, right? And, and you, see that you just see this degeneration in religious thought and the gods just become big versions of ourselves, you know? And then what happened? The Axial Age. Religiously, we run into this thing called the Axial Age from 800 BC to about 200 BC where people started religiously to wake up. And they're, they're saying, well, just a minute here. I mean, if I'm offering sacrifices so I can go to this God's heaven and all my sacrifices are local, limited, and finite, that must mean that my stay in heaven is going to be finite. I mean, how can, how can a, a finite creature pay for a ticket to eternal paradise? It's impossible. I guess I'm coming back, and that's where reincarnation comes from. That's where that began. And uh, you kind of wish these guys would have thought deeper about it. Maybe they could have thought, well, just a minute. If this animal sacrifice is insufficient, perhaps God will send an ultimate sacrifice one day and grant me eternal salvation, right? They didn't think like that. They went the other way. And uh, they began to think deeply about personal salvation. They began deep to th think deeply about metaphysics and about reality. And uh, they came away with monism, that all is one, and individuality is an illusion. All is one and all is God, and we're God too. We're just under some delusion right now. Meditate and you realize you're God. And that's very popular today, isn't it? New age modes of thinking, very popular in the Western world now. We're returning to that, right? But that's just some degeneration in religious thought and understanding. And, um, but I, before we finish here, I really just want uh, us to go to Philippians chapter 2. And we'll just look at this for a couple minutes and, 
and then uh, we can wrap it up for today. But Philippians chapter 2, you get a whole history of religion here. Okay, let's look at it. And it's, these are nice verses to think about as we, you know, we kind of wind this lecture down. There's some practical uh, value here too in what we're seeing. We're supposed to imitate Jesus. Philippians 2.4. Let's put in it 2.4. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Hey, what does that mean, by the way? He was in the form of God, and he did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Does anyone have a different translation? What's he talking about here? Any guess? Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to say it relates back how man was made in the image of God, but Jesus fulfills the full fullness of God by being God. Well, yes, it's, it does say here that he was in the form of God, but he did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Literally in the Greek, he did not consider these things to be grasped. Right? The, the King James and the New King James call it robbery. I'm going to grab that thing, take it to myself. And what Paul's getting at here is that Jesus in the form of God didn't consider divinity or deity something he needed to take to himself. Why? Because he already had it, right? He already had it, and he had it from all eternity, and he's never given it up, and he's never going to give it up. But look what happened here. Verse 7 but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow and of those in heaven and those on the earth and those under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Uh, This is an amazing verse passage here. Amazing. Uh, We are told that Jesus was in the form of God. He was, I mean, from John 17, you know he was with God before the world was. And he was glorified with God before the world was. But here we're told he took the form of a bondservant. And, And literally it says he emptied himself. He emptied himself. In the Greek. And uh, in the church, there's this been a big debate over the centuries. What did he empty himself of? Okay. Can someone tell me what did, what did that second person of the Trinity empty himself of when he became a man? Any guesses here? Divine attributes. Divine attributes. Does that sound right? No. Why not? Morally purpose. He can't stop being God. Because you just can't stop being God, right? So if he gave up, because this is very common. There are Christians who think that. He gave up some of his divine attributes. That's just to say he stopped being God, right? So it couldn't be that. Uh, Most theologians, and I agree with this perspective, would say what Jesus gave up when he became a man was independent exercise of his divine attributes. He still has all his divine attributes. He's never going to get rid of them, but he is not going to exercise them unless he was given sanction to by his father. So he will function as God when the father gives him the green light to do it. That's what he gave up. Not his, not his godhood, not his deity. As a matter of fact, uh, Jesus, we want to say, is, um, wow, Jesus, we want to say, is one person. Oh, there's one here. Okay. Thanks, love. This, this is very important. This is very important to us as we wrap this up. I really want to get this through to everyone here. But uh, you can have, um, let's call them uh, powers. What? Oh, man. Oh, dear. You can have powers. Let's call them powers or faculties. 
So let's say um, rationality, for example, or volition, you know, you can do something, right? Uh, power to act. We'll say there's a whole bunch of these things. Uh, John, would this come into it then when in Cana where um, Mary goes to him to ask him to, to do this miracle and he says, woman, my time has not yet come? Or does that come into that? Uh, I'm not starting to think about that one, how that relates to what we're talking about here. This is something else I really want to talk about though, but if we're talking about a person, and remember there are three persons in the Godhead, we're talking about a collection of faculties or powers, right? Like rationality, volition, power to act, self-awareness, uh, morality, we'll say there's a moral dimension, moral sensitivity, and so on. And there's a whole list of these things, right? We'll say a complete set of such things makes you a person. But these things are kind of a feat. They really can't do anything. They need a nature through which they can operate. Okay? And so Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, from all eternity, had the, this set of powers or faculties, and he had a divine nature through which they could operate. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, same thing. Okay? And at a point in time, that second person of the Trinity took a second nature. He didn't give up that nature, but he took a second nature, a human nature. So in Jesus, you have one person, one complete set of rational faculties, and so on. One person with two natures. One divine, he had it from all eternity. One human that he took to himself at incarnation. And that's classic Christian theology here. And this is what we believe. So, I'm not saying, you don't need to have a PhD to grasp this, and, and uh, go ahead there. Can I ask a dumb question? So, after Jesus' death and resurrection, does he now only retain his one nature, or do we still consider him to have two in any way? He still has both natures. Okay, so he still considers him. Absolutely, because remember, um, we're told in 1 Timothy 2.5, there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, and the word there, anthropos, means human being. But in Acts 17, uh, Paul says God has appointed a day in which he will judge the world, and he's going to do it through that man and heir. Now, that's a human male. That man is going to judge the world, and God has given evidence to all men in that he raised that man from the dead. So that nature was not dependent upon his body? He still has his body. Oh, so it's fine because he has a glorified human body. Yep. Okay. Yep. Whatever it means to be human, Jesus still has it. So would it be dependent upon the body? Well, if, if the, one of the necessary and sufficient conditions for being a human is to have a physical body, okay. then he's got it. Okay. And for sure, he mean, um, 1 Corinthians 15 is what this is all about, right? Uh, 58 verses in that chapter, all about the topic of physical resurrection from the dead. Jesus rose bodily from the dead. You're going to rise bodily from the dead. Paul says it's the same body you get. He says the body is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. So then does he only receive his second nature upon birth? Incarnation. Upon incarnation birth? Yeah. So then how, like who gave him that nature? How did he... Well, I think Hebrews 10 seems to indicate the Father prepared that body for him. He said, a body thou hast prepared me to do thy will, O God. So Read Hebrews 10. Yep. In the Old Testament, when you see the angel of God, lots of times we would presume that's Jesus. He would have still only had the one nature. Right. That's the pre-incarnate, right? those are Christophanies. In the Old Testament, there's this character that shows up, the angel of the Lord, the Malach Yahweh, and he's got... Uh, certain attributes, characteristics, the way he operates, he must be God. Mm -hmm. And uh, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who's in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him, so we take that to be Jesus, the pre-incarnate Christ back then. But there he's showing up in a temporary type, visible form, right? Just like when he appeared to Abraham in uh, Genesis 15 as the Word of God. The Word of God appeared to Abraham in a vision, and if that wasn't enough, the word of God appeared to Jeremiah in a vision, 
and stretched out his hand and touched Jeremiah's lips. So the word is a person, a divine person, because in, in that conversation with Jeremiah, Jeremiah refers to him as the Lord God. Is it possible for him at the end of all end times, where everything's over and when everything of all that's done, that he would shed the second nature? I don't, there's no indication of that in the Bible. It was God's, you know, it was God's plan to have a human male and his bride uh, reigning and ruling over a, a beautiful world, right? He called that very good. And that kind of got wrecked. And it just feels like God isn't going to be defeated. He's going to have his human male representative. It'll be Jesus. You know, even now in the third heaven, he's called the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Not only is he a male, but he's the promised Davidic king. He's a bona fide citizen of, of uh, Israel, the, the nation of Israel. Right? And don't we know that his marks will be a testimony forever and ever of what he's done for us? So he needs a body to show that. He, well, he shows Thomas, right? Yeah. It's me, Thomas. Yeah. Right. But I was pretty sure in Revelation it mentions that you'll see there'll be a mark of, you'll always see it. I think it's, it's hinted at there in Revelation because yeah. John says, I saw a lamb as though it had been slain standing. A lamb as though he'd been slain standing. That, that sounds to me that he may be still bearing those covenant marks in his body. He, he was dead, now he's alive, right? Would a, another way to kind of look at this also is kind of like, so would angels, like angels can do something similar to a pre-incarnate Jesus, their spirit yet can show physically. So they, but they, they're not, they don't have what the nature of humans, so they're not right. physical. Right, so yeah, an angel is a spirit. You remember that, Hebrews 1.14? Angels are ministering spirits sent forth to minister to those who will be heirs of salvation. But angels can take temporary bodies too, that's true. Right? Two angels go to Sodom and so on. But they don't, they don't share human nature with us. And God says in the book of Hebrews chapter 2 that God does not give aid to angels but to the seed of Abraham. So... Angels will not experience redemption. Fallen angels are going to the lake of fire. That's the place prepared for them. That's uh, Matthew 25. But uh, God does give aid to us. And that's very mysterious. That's, that's hidden in the counsels of God, why he would choose to govern man that, that way and offer redemption in that way. I'm just grateful for, for it, but yeah. Uh, any other thoughts or questions before we wrap up? Go ahead. Yeah, uh, real quick. Um, so... I don't. I don't. See, I, I don't see. You know, Jesus, the, the Holy Spirit, uh, any of them as being less God. But uh, it, is is it fair to say that uh, some could have an argument that because of because of his nature, he would be somehow less God? Like what you've got God the Father with, with, the, uh, with the divine nature, but then the human nature. Yeah. Would the human nature itself to anyone suggest that he was less. Well. <clears throat> I don't know what the argument. I don't know what the argument would be, because to be human does not entail being sinful. Adam was created sinless, right? And Jesus lived thirty-three years sinless human existence. So to be a human does not entail sinfulness. Um, I, in fact, you might make the argument maybe we're less than human because we still have sin in our flesh, right? But Jesus didn't lose anything. In fact, he gained something when he took that human nature. Yeah. It's true, though. We, now, here's the thing. We got to be self-consciously Trinitarian in our theology. Remember that we are dealing with a God who's three persons. So there is administrative function here. There's functional distinction within the Godhead. I mean, 1 Corinthians 15 says, at the end of it all, the Son will give up the kingdom to the Father, and he'll be subject to the Father. You know, and maybe that makes people uncomfortable, but that's how God has chosen to conduct himself. And it's all of it in the Bible shows us how God has chosen to govern man. And it's our job to um, read what he told us and to believe it and to order ourselves accordingly, right? And I know these are grand things, right? And this is lecture number one. <laughs> but um, so that's an hour. Any other concluding thoughts before we pray? Okay. Well, I'll close us in prayer, and then um, if you want to hang out for a bit and visit, you're certainly welcome to do that too. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you, Lord, for being here with us today and for um, helping us uh, <laughs> in this first lecture 
where you become the main focus, Lord God. And uh, we pray that, uh, that anything that was truthful, that was spoken here today, that you'll seal it into our hearts and minds and we'll draw upon it in just the right way to be a blessing to others and to be honoring to God. And if uh, there's anything shared here that is not true, not quite right, we pray it falls to the ground and is forgotten. And so we commit ourselves and our cares to you today, O Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Praise God. Praise God.